Thank you very much, ladies. That was wonderful. Uh, and thank you very much for the opportunity today. I never... Uh, well, I always think it's seriously handling the Word of God. It's a privilege. It's a blessing. Uh, and I'm thankful to share it all, this opportunity with you. Uh, we're going to be in two places to begin with. Go to Psalm 34. Psalm 34. You'll want to keep your finger there in Psalm 34. And for context, go to 1 Samuel 21. 1 Samuel 21. So I'll start by reading Psalm 34 in its entirety, and then we'll have 1 Samuel 21 afterwards. Psalm 34, a psalm of David, when he changed his behavior before Abimelech, who drove him away, and he departed. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto him, and were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear them, Fear him and delivereth them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. O oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Come, ye children, hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is he that desireth life and loveth many days, that he may see good? Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil, do good, seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and delivereth them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. He keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. The Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants, and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. Let's pray. Our Father, I thank you for this day. I pray, God, you'd use me at this time, help to minister to your people. I pray, God, if I in any way could be a, a part of strengthening the flock, uh, that you would even now uh, accomplish that in me. Help us, God, to have ears to hear and understand what words you want us to understand today. Thank you for everything you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So again, Psalm 34 is where we'll be, but 1 Samuel 21 is the context of this. Because if you notice, in that introduction there to this psalm, it says, a psalm of David, when he changed his behavior before Abimelech, who drove him away and departed. 1 Samuel 21, and in verse 10 the Bible says, and David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said unto him, Is not this David the king of the land? Did they not sing one to another of him in dances, saying, Saul hath slain his thousands and David his ten thousands? And David laid up these words in his heart and was sore afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. And he changed his behavior before them and feigned himself mad in their hands and scrabbled on the door of the gate and let his spittle fall down upon his beard. Then said Achish unto his servants, Lo, 
Ye see, the man is mad. Wherefore then have ye brought him to me? Have I need of madmen, that ye have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? So here's the context of Psalm 34. Don't let the names confuse you. Here it's Achish. Over in the psalm it says Abimelech. Abimelech is a term much like king, much like Pharaoh, that there would be a subname that would apply to that. It's, it's like my father is what they would refer to King Achish as at this time. And this clearly is the only event where I have David feigning his behavior for somebody. And so there's a good clue that this is what is being talked about in the context of Psalm 34. Now David hears the king essentially puffing him up. Isn't this this great King David? Isn't this this wonderful man who the maidens danced around and sang praises to him? He's slain his ten thousands while the king of Israel has only slain his thousands. David took those things and laid them to his heart. Now we ought to be careful whenever we lay something to our heart. David here became, after he did that, sore afraid of Achish, which before he had come into his presence after being sore afraid of Saul. It seems like what came into David's heart actually drove him to fear, based on the context we have here before us. Then he feigns himself. Not himself. He begins to change his behavior before the king. The Bible here says in verse 13, he changed his behavior before them, feigned himself mad in their hands. The Bible says he scrabbled on the doors of the gate and let spittle fall down on his beard. I'm not going to give you a demonstration of that purposefully, but I think you can all imagine spittle falling upon a beard. He just showed himself to be some raving lunatic. Yelling and screaming and hollering, scrabbling on the gate, spits falling everywhere. And the king goes, why'd you bring this madman before me? This is obviously not David. David's this great man. David's this mighty man. David's this man that's worthy of reverence before all for all that have fallen before him as he fought in battle. And so he dismisses the man brought before them and he lets David go. Now the result of this is good. But if you were to just read the context here, you would see, well, it didn't go so bad. Is this one of David's weaker moments? Is this a fearful moment, a teaching moment in his life? When I first read this, I thought, perhaps, because of the case of him laying it to his heart, and then fear coming immediately after. He was only in that situation for fear of Saul as he fled from him. He started in fear. He continued in fear. All along, the Lord is working there by his side. Go to Psalm 34, and we'll get to see what is the actual um, going on in David's heart at this time. Is David fearful? Is David being weak at this time? Is, is, it a, is it a moment where David needs to learn a lesson about what it means to be a strong king? Is he fearful? Is he fretting? Is he, is he concerned about all of these things going on around him? Well, I would hazard that while the text shows insecurity in Psalm, or in his heart, sorry, the Psalm shows that he had a meditation of strong confidence going on in his heart the entire time that this event was transpiring. Even though he feigned himself to be Another man. Even though the Bible clearly records that he was fearful before two kings, David was strong and confident in the Lord based on what we hear in this psalm. Psalm 34 and verse 1. Psalm 34 and verse 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Here we learn that we bless God by praising God. Now, it occurred to me after getting here that it was actually Thanksgiving, or at least that's tomorrow, but I didn't prepare a Thanksgiving message. Nevertheless, we have it starting off with blessing the Lord by praising Him. It's being thankful to God and rejoicing in all the great things that He has done. The Bible says we bless the Lord by praising the Lord. David here sets himself firm on the position and the resolve that he is going to bless the Lord some of the day. Bless the Lord first thing in the morning. Bless the Lord as long as everything's going okay in his life. 
No, no, no. David says, no, I will. He starts that. I will. I am resolved. I'm making a decision today. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be continually in my mouth. Always in my mouth. David here is resolved to, well, we know in the New Testament, pray without ceasing. We know in the New Testament, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord as being actions that come from a a heart that's full of praise for God. Praying to Him, singing to Him, rejoicing unto Him. And so David here must have got some inside information from the same Holy Spirit that we're hearing from in the New Testament. That you ought to be praising God always, without ceasing, always full of that Spirit of God by speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Continually, always, David says, I will bless God. I will praise Him. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. To God be the glory. Great things He hath done. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. This ought to be the heart of the Christian always, continually and unceasingly singing praise in your hearts unto God. David knew this. And David knew it, and that's wonderful. We all know this. But David chose to apply it. He said, I will bless the Lord. I will praise Him continually and at all times. Verse 2 begins by him saying, My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. Don't let that her make you feel uncomfortable. I believe the Hebrew word under there is a feminine noun. It's interesting. You can go study that out. I don't know what it means, but David's soul there is a feminine boasting in the Lord. And he says, I will boast. In God. In Galatians 6 and 14, you don't have to go there. The Bible says, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Another principle. Where's David getting all these New Testament principles from way back there in the old? (laughs) Could it be he has that same Holy Spirit ministering to him? I think so. God forbid that I should glory. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. Save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is no boasting. There is no glory. So for us, it's good for us. And we see here by principle, we know by the truth recorded in the Scriptures in our New Testament, brag on God. Praise God. Lift Him up. Tell Him of His own greatness. It doesn't bother Him to be reminded of that. You know, the, The Lord never gets tired of you telling Him how wonderful He is. And truly, He's the only one deserving of that type of praise, that type of rejoicing in Him, lifting Himself up. There's nothing wrong with that. Bring on choruses of of rejoicing in Him as the choruses of accusations come your way. Because David's saying, I'm going to boast. And some people might say, oh, you're boasting, you're bragging, you're full of pride. No, 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 no. No, I'm boasting in God Almighty. God! And He deserves it. Remind yourself by reminding Him how wonderful He is. Sometimes when we boast in all the great things God has done in our lives, some people might think we're proud. David here in verse 2 says, I'm going to make a boast in the Lord. But watch the second part of that verse. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. So never mind the proud that think that you're being proud, you know, projecting their own dirt on you. Now the humble will hear a humble servant of God boasting in the Almighty God and they'll be glad that God is being glorified in all things that are being done. Continually and at all times. And now David, not content to just do this alone, he says in verse 3, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Come on now, everybody. Let's magnify God together. O magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt His name together. David here wanted everybody to corporately rejoice in God. Bring all together. Let's all get together and exalt His name. Let's magnify Him. Let's bless Him with praise. Boasting in God Almighty God. 
that doeth great and wonderful things. And those that are humble will hear that and they will rejoice and they will be glad. Now even as David says here, I would invite all here to do the same. Bless the Lord always. Boast in Him personally. Magnify Him corporately. Together. That's what God here wants. That's what David here is singing about in this intro to his psalm. In this time of reflection, perhaps these were the first things that he thought of when he was finally released from the presence of Abimelech or Achish. When he finally saw some, some reprieve and some opportunity to whew, breathe a breath of fresh air for the danger that he saw might be upon him. I'm free, and he thinks to himself, I'm going to bless God continue. I'm going to praise him always. I'm going to, I'm going to magnify him. I'm going to make my boast, boast in God, and you know what? I'm going to invite some others to join me. Now remember, this is at a time when, don't lose track of the context, David fears Saul. David fears Achish. David is feigning himself to be someone else. He's acting. And the world might look at, and we might look at the context of what's going on here and say, man, this, this David, he seems to be insecure. He's feigning himself. He's acting. He's behaving like someone else. Is he in sin here? I don't believe so, though, when you see what the Holy Spirit gives us insight to his heart about. What was going on in David's mind and in his meditation as all of these events were transpiring? Insecure? No. Fully secure in God Almighty God who is now being blessed and praised and magnified. So it continues on in verse 4 and it says, I sought the Lord. David sought the Lord. We need to seek God. And it says, and he delivered me from all my fears. Isn't that wonderful? David in that moment sought the Lord, fearful of Saul, fearful of the king. And the Bible says that not David feigning himself, not David spitting on his beard, God delivered him from all his fears. First and foremost, God heard him. Secondly, he delivered him. What wonderful mercy and grace God has. Do you have a problem in your life? It's a silly question. We all do, of course. <clears throat> have you sought the Lord about it? You got struggles and strife and turmoil and confusion, and, and are you fearful? Have you sought the Lord? David says, seek the Lord. I sought the Lord, and he delivered me from all my fears. You think David is better than you? <laughs> Just a man. So David here wants everyone to corporately worship God with him, and he's going to bring some, an appeal to you. He's going to try to draw you into following him in this journey. David gives the testimony, I sought the Lord... He heard me and delivered me from all my fears. First, he goes to the Scriptures and he says, in verse 5, they, who's they? These guys. They looked on Him. They looked unto Him and were lightened. Their faces were not ashamed. I believe David here appeals to the Scriptures. Look at the prophets of old. Look at Moses and Abraham. Look at Joseph. They looked unto him and were lightened and their faces were not ashamed. Next appeal that David brings to his people, remember, these were, these were songs that were sang corporately in the congregation. These were meant to teach people. These were meant for people to look at these things and learn something. And David says, look, I sought the Lord and He delivered me. You can too. Look what happened in the Old Testament. Look what happened in the Scriptures. They looked unto him and they were lightened. Their faces were not ashamed. Next, he brings to their attention not only his own testimony, but I believe somebody he, he knew, their testimony. He says in verse 6, This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all of his troubles. Yeah, sure, he might be saying, I'm the poor man, perhaps, introspectively, but it looks to me a little bit like he's bringing an appeal to them. The Old Testament saints, they looked unto God, their faces were lightened, they were not ashamed. This poor man, he cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. 
He's brought the Scriptures and examples from the Word of God to the people as an appeal to them to seek God. He brings the testimony of this poor man cried. And the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. And in verse 7, he brings a promise of God that you ought to commit to memory. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. Not only do you have God Almighty God in your corner saving you, helping you, keeping you, protecting you, but you have the angel of the Lord encamping round about you if you fear God. David here wants you to praise the Lord. David here wants you to boast in the Lord, magnify and exalt the Lord. He also wants you to fear God. And that's uncommon in today's church. You can read down in verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Come, ye children, hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. David thought this was an important topic. Look, he's gathered Israel together Encourage them to seek God. He's gathered all Israel together and said, look, do you want to be delivered from your fear? Fear God above all things. His angel will encamp around about you. Fear God above all things. You will be delivered. You will be saved out of all your troubles. You will not be afraid. You'll be lightened. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is instruction of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is wisdom. In other places, the Bible says, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And an aside, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord prolongeth days. The fear of the Lord is strong confidence. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. The fear of the Lord tendeth to life. That's giving life and that's drawing you unto life. To the believer, the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is his treasure. And yet to the church, I tend to think a lot of us Sometimes think of God as the big guy in the sky instead of giving him proper fear and reverence and respect and being humble before him. The fear of the Lord is your treasure. The early church had said of them, and mind you, this was on the heels of the first great persecution that they experienced at the hands of Saul of Tarsus who went about hailing men and women out of their houses to put them to death. The Bible says at that time, the early church was walking in the fear of Paul of Tarsus, Saul of Tarsus, whatever. I just mixed it up. Saul of Tarsus? No. They're walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost and were multiplied. The strongest persecution right out of the gates. You imagine you just, you just come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and you join up with these groups and they're meeting every day, going from house to house, preaching and singing and rejoicing in God together. They're hearing preaching. They're reading the Scriptures. They're enjoying themselves and suddenly fire and torment and rage comes from the world upon them. Where would comfort come in that time? But... The Holy Ghost. They feared God and they were multiplied. That's incredible. When you think about it, does the church today want? Does the church of Jesus Christ today suffer lack? Do they have any wisdom? Do they have any knowledge? 
Does the church have any confidence? Is the church clean? Does the church look like it's going to endure forever? Will it prolong her days? If the answer is no, it's because there's no fear of God in this place. Do you individually lack, suffer need? Do you have strong confidence? Do you feel drawn into life? Are you living clean? Are you living enduring? Do you have wisdom? Do you have knowledge? Do you have confidence? The answer is no. Fear of the Lord is missing in your life. Turn back quickly to uh, Psalm 27. And while you do, let me read Luke 12, and verse 5. Luke 12, verse 5, it says, you're going to Psalm 27. Jesus said, I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. And the Bible says of our God, he is a consuming fire. Now look at David here in Psalm 27. Verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war should rise against me. In this will I be confident. David's confidence was in his God. And the truth is plainly revealed there. If you fear God, <laughs> whom should I fear? If there's an army encamped against you, of whom shall I be afraid? I think from the outside looking in as we read the narration of, and go back to Psalm 32, David before Abimelech changing his behavior, the fear of Saul, the fear of King Achish there. Looking in, you might say, hey, David, David was afraid. David was fearful. David, David was, was shaking, his knees knocking together. But David says, oh, no, no. My God who's my light and my salvation my God, who's my strength, the strength of my life, is where I am confident. I'm confident in Him. Whom shall I fear? Of whom shall I be afraid? It's not saying you're never going to be concerned. You're never going to be worried. You're never going to have fear come upon you for what's going on out there in the world. It's not saying you're never going to doubt and be concerned and have cares and have struggles and have strife, but what it's saying is when that comes upon you, seek the Lord. He'll hear, He'll deliver you from all of your fears. Now more than ever, we need the fear of God in our lives. Now more than ever, we need to seek Him. Back in Psalm 34. In verse 11, David has just invited the children. Come, ye children, hearken unto me. And I think he's talking to spiritual children. You know, there might have been 20-somethings, 30-somethings, 40, 50, 60-somethings that could be considered children of God. Come, ye children, and hearken unto me. But also, he's talking to actual children, little children, we children. Nobody's too young to be taught the fear of the Lord. Nobody's too young to understand that God Almighty God is God Almighty God. Was that deep? <laughs> the greatest of all, the, the King of kings, Lord of lords, who created heaven and earth. He is King. He is Lord. He is to be revered. He is to be feared above all. Look, every kid out on the playground, they, they say, you know what? Well, let's settle this. Let, let, let's get my dad out here, and he'll just beat up your dad, and that'll be it, right? Everybody's dad is, is the biggest, strongest. Like, every little girl, every little boy just says, man, my dad can do anything, right? 
The reality is, is we all have a Father in heaven who's greater than all. Remember Jesus when He was talking about our secure salvation in Him? He says, no man can pluck you out of my hands. And if that wasn't great enough, that, that, that the Word of God who spoke everything into existence says, look, I got you. He says, you know what? My Father that is greater than all, He's also got you in His hands. No man can pluck you out of my Father's hands. Come ye children, hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. See that? That's something you can learn. That's something you can grow in. Fear of God. If you don't have enough fear of the Lord in your life, remember I told you the symptoms. You're, you're making unwise decisions. You don't have strong confidence. You're lacking knowledge. You feel your days are waning. You don't have life. You don't have the treasure of God. You're not experiencing that. If, if you're lacking fear of the Lord, ask Him to teach you. Teach me the fear of the Lord. And God will. And each of us at our own pace. Some of those prayers are the hardest prayers to pray. Sometimes we don't like the results. God, teach me to be patient. Get ready for a trying time. <laughs> right? God, God, teach me to pray. Uh-oh, hang on. You're about to, you're about to have, have some needs enter your life. And I'll tell you that every time I've prayed prayers like that, in the, in the moments after, when I begin to regret having that, that conversation with God, when I begin to think to myself, like, what was I thinking? Everything was going good. It was fine. I liked it there. <laughs> right? But God begins to work in you and, and what you wanted, fear of God, what you wanted, more, more prayer, what you wanted, a closeness with Him, what you wanted, you begin to see just how beautiful it is and it's a treasure to you to fear God. It's a treasure to you to seek unto Him and be close to Him. And on the other side of all the trouble and trials and turmoil and strife, you'll go, that was worth it. That was worth it. And some people might say, you're nuts if you enjoyed that. And honestly, I, I, remember, I remember time sprawled out in my driveway in the pouring rain and I couldn't, even, I couldn't even put my muscles together to get me up off of the ground. Just blubbering about things going on in my life. <clears throat> and now I look back and I'm like, that was the greatest moment. That was one of the most amazing times with God. When you're going through things, hey, David was going through some things. He was, he was in danger of being killed by not one, but two kings. <clears throat> we don't have kings these days, but we have dignities that are, are, are thinking they're kings. And we might find ourselves one day in trouble with one, two, three, who knows how many kings, supremes, authorities, Right? We may, we may be in, in a moment, and I'm a little bit you know, closer than you guys are. I can spit in my beard and pretend I'm crazy. Maybe they'll let me go, right? <laughs> That's application. I'm going to apply that one day, maybe. <laughs> but regardless, whatever we're going through, seek God. Fear Him above all things. That's what David here is, is telling you. Look, when I was afraid, I sought the Lord. He heard me. Isn't that amazing? God heard you. And he says, and delivered me out of all my fears. They looked unto him. They were lightened. Their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. Great testimonies of God Almighty, God doing wonderful things in people's lives. They encourage us. They strengthen us. And they, and they give us a desire to live as they lived. From verse 11, you can read down to verse... Uh, Let's go to 14. Come, ye children, hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is he that desireth life and loveth many days? That he may see good. Any man here that wants to live a long life, see many days of good and joy? Hey, well, come unto me. I'll teach you the fear of the Lord. That's where it is. Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. Watch what you're saying. That tongue is a fire full of unruly evil and deadly poison. With that same tongue, 
You bless God, and with that same tongue, you curse men that are in the image of God. Watch what you're saying. Keep your tongue from evil. Keep your lips from speaking guile. You know what? If you're fearing God, you do that a little bit more. You know those kids talk differently when they're around adults and their parents? But have you ever caught them when they're thinking they're away from them? Aches. Right? But if you're in the fear of God, hey, life. Many good days. You'll be kept from guile and speaking evil. In verse 14 it says, Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. So here's just a little bit of instruction from King David, great father of the faith. He says, I'm going to teach you some things. You want life? Fear God. If you keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking guile, if you depart from evil, do good, seek peace and pursue it, Hey, you're walking in the fear of God. And these are also just byproducts of of living in reverence to God. Remind yourself, God's watching. Careful little ears what you hear. Careful little eyes what you see. For your Father up above is looking down on us. Careful little eyes what you see. Come children, I'll teach you the fear of the Lord. In verse 15, it says, The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are upon their cry, are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. There's David just giving you a little bit of an insight of what he's experienced regarding the cares of his God Almighty. His eyes are upon the righteous, his ears are open to their cry. But those same eyes that are looking to his own, to the righteous, are against them that do evil. He desires here to cut off their remembrance from the earth. Do you want to stand as the righteous or do you want to stand as them that do evil? Do you want to have God looking upon you for your good or turning his face from you? That he could just forget. God has care for His people. He has His eyes on His people. The Bible says that we are the apple of His eye. If you were to look way back in the story of Abraham, you'll find the promise made, I will bless those that bless thee and curse those that curse thee. Don't let go of that as a promise from God. Don't give that to another group. That promise is for the children of God. The Bible says in Galatians 3 and verse 29, it says, If ye are Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. If you're Christ, if you're his child, if you're born again, if you're blood bought, those promises Abraham received are yours through faith, faith in God, the Bible says. And this here is just what David is explaining to us. Look, the righteous. Hey, I didn't become righteous by bringing filthy rags to God. (laughs) Oh, I became righteous by coming to God. Believing on Christ. Because I am of Christ, I'm Abraham's seeds, heirs according to the promise. And God's ears are upon me and God's eyes are upon me. And the face of the Lord turns away from the others. Just remind yourself. The world is, 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 is attacking. The world is provoking. The world is tempting you. Hey, look, God's face isn't even pointed that way. But you know who he's looking at? His own, the believers. Verse 17, the righteous cry. And the Lord heareth and and delivereth them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Look, He heareth, He delivereth, He saves, He is nigh. He hears, He delivers, He saves, He's nigh. That means He's close to those that walk before Him in a broken, contrite 
spirit. You know what that is? Humility. You know what that is? Lowliness, meekness. You feel broken today? God's ready. He's nigh. He's close to hear, to deliver, and to save you. Seek Him! Do we need a reason to praise Him today? Are we struggling to find one? Start by praising Him for Him. Start by praising Him for what He's done, what you have, what you hold, for your hopes, for your promises, for everything that God has given you. All good things come from above, from the Father of lights. Look, life is challenging these days. <laughs> and there's many trying times. And, it, and I, I strongly believe it's only going to get worse from here on in. I think there's scriptural promises according to that. <clears throat> the Bible says, Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That doesn't sound like a reason to praise, except for to those that are of a humble and contrite spirit and understand that their God is in control of all of these things, overseeing things, if you will, watching you, caring for you, waiting to hear from you. Don't make God wait. Seek Him. Verse 20, it says, he keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. I know that's a promise uh, in, in, a, in a prophecy of Jesus Christ up there on the cross. Where he hung there between heaven and earth and bled, suffered, died, breathed his last breath. And to confirm his death, they slid a spear between his ribs. Not one of his bones was broken. Hey, but let's for a moment remember the context here and what David's talking about. In verse 19, he says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. He keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. You know you'll not be broken. Serving God. I love that. He, he keepeth all his bones. Not one of them is broken. The context is the afflictions that the righteous are going through. The Lord delivereth them out of them all. A Christian leaning on God will never break. Will never be broken. Just remember that. <clears throat> the Bible talks about, about nations leaning on, on the staff that is Egypt, or, or the world. And they said, if you lean on that staff, if you lean on the world, it'll smite right through your hands. That, that, that staff will break you to bits. But, but God says, you know what? I keepeth. He keepeth all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Why? Because God's attentive to you. God's ready to hear you. God's waiting to hear you. And when fear enters in, seek him early. Fear him above all things. Whom shall I fear? Of whom shall I be afraid? Verse 21, it says, Evil shall slay the wicked. And they that hate the righteous shall be desolate, empty, void, having nothing, slain before God. Verse 22, The Lord redeemeth the soul of His servants, and none of them that trust in Him shall be desolate. He just took all of His promises that He would place on those that curse His people, and he said, I'll turn that around and you'll be blessed in the opposite way. Evil shall slay the wicked, but the Lord will redeem the soul of his servant. They that hate the righteous shall be desolate, but none of them that trust in God shall be desolate ever. Why? Right? Because God's eyes are upon you. God's ears are ready to hear your cry. When the righteous cry, do you know what the Lord does? He hears and he delivers and he saveth those, because he's nigh, he's ready, he's able, he's wanting to hear your voice. Call out to him today. David, in reflection of what was going on, just in that moment of challenge when two kings were threatening to destroy him, he says, I'll bless and praise God continually at all times. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. 
The humble will hear this and be glad. Come with me, magnify God. I sought the Lord. Come with me and experience this. He heard me. He delivered me from all my fears. They all look to Him. Look at all these examples we have of faithful men of old looking to God and He saved them. They were lightened. They were never ashamed. He looks out. He says, this poor man cried. This poor man cried. That poor man cried. This poor man cried. And the Lord heard him. That promise is for every. Blessed be ye poor. For theirs is the kingdom of God, Jesus said. This poor man cried. And the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. As a church here today, we need to lean on the Scriptures and the promises of God. See them and apply them. Don't let anybody try to remove these promises from you and say, oh, that's for somebody else. That doesn't apply. No, every line is mine. This is a love letter from a loving God, an almighty Creator God, speaking to His own. Lean on the Scriptures. Lean on the promises that are there. Seek God. He'll hear. He'll deliver. As a church, let's trust Him. Let's, let's obey Him. Let's look to Him. Let's fear Him about all, above all things. And you know what? As we do that, this is what David here is teaching. Fear of the Lord. Trust Him, seek Him. Fear the Lord. Trust Him, seek them. As that happens, you're fearing God, you're trusting Him, seeking Him, not just individually, but collectively. Then we can come together and we can go, this poor man cried, the Lord heard and delivered him. That poor man cried and the Lord heard him and delivered him. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and delivered him. This poor man cried and the Lord heard me and delivered me. And He'll do the same for you. Some of you have a jingle going on in your head right now. <laughs> this poor man cried, the Lord heard him, and saved him out of his troubles. Saved him out of his troubles. Saved him out of his troubles. This man cried, the Lord heard him, and saved him out of his troubles. And he'll do the same for you. And again, this poor man cried, the Lord heard him, and saved him out of his troubles. Saved him out of his troubles, saved him out of his troubles. This man cried, the Lord heard him, and saved him out of his troubles. And he'll do the same again, and he'll do the same, and he'll do the same for you. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> That's amazing. What a God. And so when you look in the Scriptures and you see a story of, of a man of God fearing and fretting, just remind yourself, I bet you there was a song in his heart. When David was facing Abimelech and Saul, who were both trying to kill him and destroy him, there was Psalm 34 going on in his heart. And he was saying, I'm going to bless God. I'm going to praise God. I'm going to magnify God, and I can't wait to get out of this so I can tell everybody to join me. Sing that testimony about how God heard me, about how God delivered me from all my fears. Who are you going to fear if you're fearing God? For whom shall you be afraid? God's your stay. Amen.